I was unable to stream podcasts for a big chunk oh, of time. It's devastating. That I was there. You had to sit in the silence of your own thoughts. Yeah, my own terrible thoughts. <laughs> what did you really lean on in terms of internal anxieties? I mean, the idea that I would get, we've canceled two Christmases, we've canceled a funeral attendance, we've canceled a bunch of family celebrations this year. And I would then, after not doing any of those things, I but what I would get on an airplane to do is go to a conference with a couple thousand people in a the literal worst part of the pandemic in terms of case numbers right now. And I would fly to Phoenix, to Phoenix Arizona. Arizona from Florida. So two places right. where it's Both bad. Both notoriously cautious peoples. And I would go and I would stay in a hotel room and go to five days of talks and social events. And then I guess be fine. Everything's going to be just cool. <laughs> No one will have COVID, that's for sure. Well, I'm glad you had some good time in the silence of your own heart to really dwell on that. While you were doing that, I was battling a frog in our home. <laughs> I You emerged victorious. I did. And I, I don't mean that I killed it, dear listener. It is now outside somewhere. But well, like I was, you know, cleaning up from our big... New, it's New Year's Day. It is January 1st, the year of our Lord, 2022. I was up when Allison was at the lab today, cleaning up from our big bash that was just the two of us here last night. And as I was starting to move some of the bottles in the kitchen, the big, the biggest fucking frog I've ever seen, uh, like <laughs> leapt out of the area and onto the wall. And this frog is was big i don't know how it got in the house it seems like it shouldn't have been able to get into the house but it was big it's even bigger than the previous frog that seemed like <laughs> it, was, it impossible. was impossible that it could have gotten into the house because of its size yeah i don't know i guess frogs are super good at that or something but it it was like i mean it's a frog so when i would try to to catch it it would leap like four feet Onto another wall or something. It was like fucking flying around the kitchen. And it was a tree frog. Like it was clinging to vertical surfaces yeah, yeah, yeah. easily. Definitely yeah. a tree frog. Anyway, ultimately captured it and uh, and brought it back outside where it can now figure out how to get into our house again. Well, I was almost at work when you called me, which I answered because I, again, I understood that it must be an emergency if you were <laughs> well, calling me. it seemed me. like an emergency. And, and you, what you were Calling to tell me is, there's a frog. <laughs> yeah. Breaking news. And Do you I, think that's good luck? Like good New Year's yeah, luck? Yeah, I assume. Yeah, let's go with that. And I said, do what I did with the last frog and <laughs> catch it in a yogurt container and put it outside. Actually, I didn't put the last frog outside. I have to admit I did murder it, but that's because it was another species that's an invasive oh. and you're supposed to murder them if you get them. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was a tough call for exactly what to do in that scenario. But anyway. Yeah, well, that was when Lucy was still alive, too, so... There's a real risk that she would get into a fight with that frog if you didn't deal with it. Well, I could have put it outside, but it turns out it's invasive enough that it's actually illegal. If Oh, that's really? Like, what, what I read online was it, once you have captured it, it technically is illegal to put it's it now, outside. You, it's now your, it's now your problem <laughs> uh, because you'd be yeah, releasing this right. into the wild. Anyway. Uh, and you said, I think it's too big to fit in a yogurt container. Yeah. I ended up catching it in like a pot. Like our, our cooking pot? Yeah. Did you consider briefly making frog legs? <laughs> wow. That's really, we're led to believe as children that that's a delicacy that will be, that's available constantly to like rich adults. And the reality is the only time I've ever heard about frog legs having been consumed in the last 20 years is when Donald Trump <laughs> made Mitt Romney eat them with him as a yeah. form of like domination <laughs> <laughs> leading to that great picture. I did see that some 
vegan artificial frog legs had made it to market. Whoa, really? Recently, I saw something about that on the internet. So I didn't know there was demand for that. Apparently, some some people like frog legs so much. <laughs> so they're the, they're otherwise they're in the same category as Donald Trump, you know, of like '80s rich people who still want frog legs, but they're also vegan. That must be such a narrow pool of people. Yeah, I'm looking this up right now to Mm. make sure I didn't hallucinate it. Are they shaped to look like frog legs? Are they shaped to look like the hello, my baby, hello, my honey, hello, my ragtime gal frog? Like those legs? Those were the legs that were made into frog legs in cartoons as a child. Yeah, definitely. So, okay, I actually found the product on, I guess... Maybe this is a grocery store website. This is clearly, so this product seems to be available in the UK. And I'm on the Long Dan website, and it says the plant-based store vegan frog legs. Honestly, they look like terrible chicken nuggets. Yeah. Like they look really gray and (laughs) upsetting. Yeah. So I think they're sort of tempeh-based. All right. The instructions say can be eaten or cooked once defrosted. So I guess they're, they're fully pre-cooked. cooked, but you can also cook them more. Anyway, so that's real. Wow, gross. Yeah, anyway, that frog's living its best life outside now. Or it's already been eaten by <laughs> Who knows? One of our many neighborhood cats, perhaps. You're Roman. And you are Allison, and this invasive podcast is known as CD Business. And by that, I mean, if you are in possession of it, you have to kill it. It's illegal to release this. <laughs> it's city business. It's city business. Okay, so like I mentioned, it is uh, New Year's Day. This person's coming to our door, perhaps. Yeah, that was my concern as well. <laughs> She's clearly unnerved by our podcast recording equipment that she sees through the window. So uh, we were just interrupted by our rich, maybe our only rich neighbor from across the street that was was asking us if they've we... never spoken to us no, they've, not at all they've lived here for like more than a year yeah for sure but we overheard them talking when they moved in about how they're going to flip this house and use it as an investment property so we also never went out of our way to yeah, introduce ourselves sure. to them but she she just came over asking us if we were the ones setting off the fireworks <laughs> last night <laughs> Yeah, no, she's pretty course, mad about it. She's pretty it. pissed off because she, quote, just got her car detailed. Her fucking nice car there across the street. No, they were they were fucking yard kids that yeah, were out there. There's like a off. bunch of neighborhood kids. There were probably like six or eight of them at yeah. least from multiple households who all convened in the nearest intersection to our home and set off firework <laughs> after firework for hours. For hours. hours. Yeah. Let me tell you something. You what? know, I I mean, I'm not doing anything about that ever. Yeah, I didn't it's not like I love that they were setting off those fireworks, but let me tell you something. The best part of those people setting off the fireworks is that it pissed off that lady. Yeah. And that got all over her fancy <laughs> car. <laughs> That's the real silver lining to that for me. <laughs> I mean, I think it's very funny that she decided to yell at me, but she d- has not gone down the street to knock on anyone else's yeah. doors. I mean, it definitely was kids and the house immediately next to her and then the other house immediately next to us is definitely where some of those kids live, but mm. I wasn't going to narc on them. Yeah, no, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> and those kids and their families are like MAGA. Oh, as hell. big time. And but- I'm still not narking on them to that fucking lady. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> She wants us to narc on teens. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> she only is willing to yell at me because she knows that we're weak. 
maybe it's because I said, listen, man, I was just glad they weren't shooting guns in the air yeah. that she was reminded that maybe she shouldn't go confronting the sort of people mm. who set off a hundred fireworks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. It's New Year's Day. I'm a little hungover still. I don't know how you're doing. I have. I mean, I'm not going to say that I'm feeling my absolute best today. Yeah. But could be worse. Yeah. I mean, technically, we each had two, we each had three drinks because you had your pregame cocktail before yeah. I made us each two cocktails. You and made then, these, these cocktails were deceptively powerful. And then, I, yeah. And then I had a small glass of, of sparkling wine around midnight. But yeah, it turns out those cocktails were very They're strong, potent. much stronger than it seemed like they should be. They, <laughs> they, destroyed both of us yeah definitely i mean i'm definitely a one drink a day person that's the right amount nothing feels as good as the first one but i made the mistake yet again last night hey do you have any new year's resolutions you've completed all of them already as far as i know yeah so i basically started off thinking yesterday when i was thinking about it i was like you know what i'm gonna there are a bunch of things that i keep saying i'm gonna do so those are going to be my New Year's resolutions. But then I ended up doing all of them yesterday. Because <laughs> before the New Year. Before midnight. Because it turns out that all of them were things that would take five minutes, but that I have been procrastinating <laughs> on and talking about doing for many months in some cases, what but then just things? never doing it. Uh, well, one of them, I don't know if I want to tell everyone. I can't remember. One of them was make simple syrup. That's right. <laughs> so you did complete that So I did that. One. I mean, the idea that you could Took make your minutes. to-do list and call it your New Year's resolutions well, on to, one particular day of the year, that's pretty cool. It's a way to get some real victories. Well, mine is, as it ever is, every year for the past five years, is to pee sitting down from now on, when in the home, not outside of the home, not like if I'm at work or something, but... Well, you've been trying for five years and have not yet succeeded, so I, I don't have, know if it's going to happen. I take that as a, a motivating challenge. Uh, <laughs> yeah, usually I... Maybe you just don't want to, though. Well, of course. it's I don't want to. It's easier and lazier to stand up when I pee, but it seems like it would be cleaner and better for everybody if I sat down. I thought the reason you wanted to do it is you were concerned about fully emptying your bladder was that not part of the motivation no is it will you get a fuller evacuation seated really well that's that's doubly motivating actually i didn't realize that that was true all right i mean i don't know maybe i'm maybe that's not true but <laughs> i feel like i i thought that was part of your motivation originally huh. was the theory that, well, that it's been would... so many years i don't even remember but i feel like i got a good good a good shot at it this year my supplementary resolution last year was to be more optimistic. How have you done with that? Well, here's the thing. You have to judge it against baseline. Like, everything's gotten worse over the last year and may continue to get worse. So, you, Well, the fact that you said may suggests you do have a more optimistic <laughs> attitude. Yeah. Yeah, but I like I I don't want to like completely, you know, escape the realm of realism or anything. Like I want to accept the world as it is. So I think like I especially compared to the previous year, I do think I improved in that way again against the evolving baseline. And I think that's a good one to keep in mind again for me. Yeah, that's great. I actually, I did today hear a New Year's resolution that I'm now considering adopting because well, I think it was that? good. So I was listening to, there's a, a confession here. I listened to Judge John Hodgman without you. Oh, okay. And uh, Josh Gondelman said that his New Year's resolution is that when he's not doing the stuff he's supposed to be doing, to at least be doing the stuff he wants to be doing. Uh-huh. That's like... Sh- that's like a very long way of saying, don't read Twitter all the time. Yeah, I think. I think, yeah. <laughs> Actually, that should be my additional New Year's resolution. One problem with my version of it is I would have to know what I want to be doing. Yeah, well, that is a big, that's a big ask. I'm going to throw one more on there, which is uh, sort of a classic one of read more books. 
but it, it's not because I think that I, I mean, I guess my brain does need stimulation, whatever, but I, I do, you know, on the occasion where I have a few days off and I can read a book, I'm actively relaxed by it mm, <laughs> in like a pretty serious way. It really diminishes my anxiety. So as a, as a method of anxiety control, mm. more than anything, I think it's a good thing to do. And like not on a screen either, like a physical book, I think, which I've always probably when I met you, I, I mean, I still hate physical books as objects. That's a hot take. Well, yeah, that, you hate them because they are cumbersome. I hate them because it was a time where I was fucking moving every six months slash or was living in my car or whatever. And just moving boxes of them over and over and over again made me despise the book as a physical object. But if it's not a screen, then there's no there's no temptation to read about how well neutralizing antibodies work against w- some emergent variant in France right now. Elson, what what is in the garden? Then let us cultivate our garden. It's the only way to make life endurable. Well, we just harvested a pretty nice amount of kumquats. Yeah, this is a landmark day. It's, again, New Year's Day. We have finally harvested, like we did the big harvest of all the kumquats. I'll post a picture. Got a bunch of them. Yeah. And I guess I guess the question of what's in the garden is really now becomes, as we are in the dead of winter, it was 80 degrees here today. What What's in next year's garden? I know you feel pretty pessimistic about it, but... Yeah, should I try to feel more optimistic about gardening? Maybe, yeah. Here's an idea. I think we should go fucking all in on tomatoes. I think we should use our... And and this is uh, not taking into account, like, I think we should plant some basil and, you know, greens and stuff again, like around where there's spot. But I think otherwise we should use all of our space and plant a wide variety of tomatoes and see what happens. See if we get one of them to work. Well, we should get those seeds from our friend who says she has tomatoes that grow well locally. Yeah, definitely. And we should really focus on those, I think. Yeah. I want to get some I want to get good tasting tomatoes out of our garden this year, and I think if that means devoting our whole garden space to it, why the fuck not? I was going to say Think about what can grow in predominantly sand and focus on that, which would not really be tomatoes. But mm-hmm. Well, but we tried stuff that's supposed to be able to grow in sand and still still didn't work great. Yeah. Anyway, we'll we'll continue to consider it. All right. So the first catalog we're going to do in this in this new year, we're going to look at the So True Seed catalog. Now. Uh, that is the, the so is in sowing seed, not that like, oh, the seeds are so true, so true seed, so true, comma seed. Uh, no, it is S-O-W, so true seed. We've read from this catalog, but have never read exclusively from this catalog before. So they were founded in 2008 by uh, a woman named Carol Corey. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. It's K-O-U-R-Y. She's a self-described food activist. Uh, Their mission statement is to, quote, preserve our shared botanical heritage and grow a new era of ecological wisdom, which is some some hippie language. You would not be surprised to learn that they are are out of the mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. If you turn to the, the inner cover of the catalog, you will see You'll see a, a lovely picture of their their workers who, if you just glanced at it, you might say, this is a bunch of women who live in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, and I mean that in the, the best way. And in fact, really miss these people being in my life uh, now that we, we live down here. But they are not just uh, workers. As of this year, they have become uh, worker owners. So they have become a uh, worker-owned co-op as of 2022, uh, which is exciting and a good reason to profile them, I think. 
Their mission goes on to say that they are they're proud to work with farmers in the Katua bioregion uh, who ensure the survival of heirloom varieties that would otherwise become extinct. So that is part of their mission. You can buy their seeds at, on their map, it looks like 68 physical locations, mostly throughout the Mid-Atlantic and, and the South, including at Barnes Supply Company on 9th Street in Durham, which is a place and a, uh, and a site that I know well from our previous life. What do you think about the design of the catalog? First of all, you know I'm sort of a fan of the smaller-sized paper. Sure. And this is a small catalog that you can comfortably hold with one hand, which I really like. Yeah, I was thinking as I was looking through of it that it actually has a lot of features that you've stated that you really favor in catalogs, actually. The cover art is beautiful. It's not immediately apparent what the medium is, but it's not a photograph. It's drawing, painting, collage, some some process, maybe a hybrid of hand drawn and digital. Mm. I'm really not sure, but it's just a it's a collection of plants. We've got columbine, okra, it looks like maybe the fennel or something, and there are pollinators, there are bees and butterflies depicted. There's an ear of corn. It's yeah, it's a beautiful yeah, cover image. It's lovely. It's the best the best kind of cover. And yeah, inside it says about the cover artist, Juana Beffert is a Romanian-born graphic artist and freelance illustrator, wife and mother of two based in the Midwest United States. Her mixed media illustrations are hand-drawn and reflect her unique visual approach and love for the natural world. Inspired by folk motifs, flora, fauna, nostalgia, and everyday life, she is capturing the essence of her subjects and themes with visual balance, adding a quirky and modern interpretation to them. Yeah, I love catalogs that commission art from from folks for either the covers or or art throughout or uh, the you know seed packet design and stuff. And I like to read about those artists too. Yeah, I love it when I love it when they do this. And then. So the first, the cover and then the first page are glossy, but then after that, it's newsprint, which mm. again is a feature that I really like in yeah. a catalog. And it is color newsprint throughout. And I, I think uh, the, the printing quality is very good. Some of the, if I'm going to nitpick the yellow ink, you can tell wherever it says how many days it takes for the seed to grow. Uh-huh. Like it looks blurry. Oh, yeah, that seems like a print, you know, every once in a while there'll be like a printing error. Yeah, I mean, not on every page, but there are a number of pages where it does seem like the color registration is off and it becomes really apparent. I didn't catch that. When looking at, yeah, like the number of days because it's in a different color. Mm -hmm. I will say that I personally really, really like their font choices. Yeah, I mean, they've chosen some perfectly legible serif fonts. Yeah, I think it's 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 a nice serif that is not, you know, you risk seeming, I guess, like old fashioned or whatever. But I think it's a nice hip serif that, you know, looks real good on the page. Very easy to read. Yeah. And they have two nice columns. What do you think about their equal um, widths on each page? Sure. Uh, what do you think about their so it, it like we've said, is it all in color? And they've got a lot of photographs. The photographs are extremely small, relatively. Yeah, that's true. I don't know how you feel about that. I think they're they look good and appear to be like of good quality and detail, even in their smallness. But you know, there's of course there's a there's something gained from big, beautiful color photographs. Yeah, these are pretty much the smallest images they possibly could use. Yeah. It's like if you put a quarter on the page, it would cover the image, basically. Right. Yeah. I mean, I agree it would be nice to have slightly bigger pictures, but I'm not bothered. By I'm not it bothered by it yeah. at all. And there's quite a lot of space in the catalog that's taken up with instructions on how to save different types of seeds. You know, if they wanted to have a catalog that was the same length with bigger images, they definitely could. Like they could have the same number of pages and take out that information. But it's, you know, it's a very conscious choice to include it. It actually is called the Planting and Seed Saving Guide. Like that's the Mm. catalog title. At the very beginning of the catalog, somewhere in the first few pages, 
Allison's holding the physical catalog right now. They define like they have, they have a series of definitions. One of which is is what an heirloom plant is, which is is something that we probably all know well at this point. One is what it means when something is open pollinated. And I was embarrassed to realize that I absolutely did not know what that meant until I read this description. I'm wondering if you might read the way they define open pollinated. Sure. The term open pollinated means that a variety is genetically stable, which means you can save seeds from the plants, replant them the next year, and get the same variety. That is, open pollinated varieties grow true to type. This is not the case for hybrids. Hybrid varieties, often designated F1 for filial one, i.e. first generation, are created by the controlled cross-pollination of two totally different parent varieties. The F1 plants will be very uniform, but if you save seeds from those plants and replant them, you'll get a wide range of different types in the next generation. F1 varieties aren't genetically stable, and for that reason, farmers and gardeners have to buy new F1 seed every year from whatever company owns the parent lines for the hybrid. Every variety of seed we sell at So True is open pollinated, so it's always possible to save your own true type seed when you buy from us. We believe it's important that gardeners be able to save their own seed in order to maintain both genetic diversity and cultural heritage in our food crops. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, being. I don't know how to describe it uh, in any other way. Being an ignoramus, uh, <laughs> I I had, did not know that. I guess whenever I saw open pollinator, I guess internally, I never thought too hard about it, but assumed that meant like, oh, it was like, you know, naturally pollinated by pollinators instead of like pollinated by like, like assisted by hand or something like that. But I guess the fact that it means genetically stable is was a revelation to me. Yeah, I mean, it's in contrast to hybrid. I It never occurred to me that you didn't know that, yeah, actually. Yeah, you don't know a lot of the ways in which I'm ignorant. <laughs> I look forward to, to revealing them to you one by one as a treat over the years of our life together. <laughs> I'm going to start with lima beans because there are several that have Variety names that I like. Yeah. Shanty Boat Butter Bean. <laughs> this seed came from the amazing seed saver John Coy Kendall. Very prolific and colorful with mottled white and red seed coats. Gets its name from the fact that it was grown near riverbanks by people living on shanty boats during the Great Depression. Well, that's cheery. <laughs> well, as a person who lived in their car at one point briefly, shanty boat sounds. Like a step up. Like a step up. It definitely was not, I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah, probably not. (laughs) King of the garden pole. That's that's not what she said. That's... Yeah, there's something in there. There's something there. All right. Well, king of the garden pole. A vigorous variety of pole lima bean with dark green pods and creamy white beans with a honey-like flavor. Vines grow to 10 feet. Honey-like bean. Yeah, I don't know about that. I don't think I've ever had a bean that tasted (laughs) reminiscent of honey. Colored willow leaf butter bean. This small seeded willow leaf type butter bean has beautiful varying colors and modeling. Very prolific and hardy with pole habit can reach 8 to 10 feet tall. I mean, I don't know what a willow leaf type butter bean is. (laughs) Yeah, I don't either. I guess I've never grown lima beans. I think I probably mentioned this in the podcast years ago, but my dad loved lima beans growing up. Mm. And I think I was not into them as a child when we had them. I think I thought they were like mealy. Yeah. I mean, I loved lima beans as a kid. I think they're mealy, but I guess that's what they're going for. Yeah. I think I would like them now. I don't know what it was about them at that point that I wasn't into, but. Would you like to read a few seed descriptions? Yeah. yeah I guess I'll keep going with the. Uh, With some pole beans. There is the Lazy Wife Greasy, which is a really is quite a stunning name, I think. Called Lazy Wife because the gardeners, who were traditionally the women of the family, could wait longer to harvest and get more food per harvest as these beans are just that big. I mean, that seems like they're being smart and efficient, not lazy, but all right. Yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, Thick, fleshy. Idea (laughs) that it is lazy to wait until the appropriate time to (laughs) harvest your crops. 
and get a lot of food per unit of effort. Thick, fleshy, and stringless pods remain tender until the beans are quite large, originally from Madison County, North Carolina. There's the Fat Man, a very heavy producer of tender and flavorful 5-inch pods on 6-7 to foot vines. There's a lot of documentation of this bean being grown for 100 plus years in both Virginia and West Virginia, where it remains popular to this day. Then there's the Mountaineer White Half Runner. It's a mouthful. A flavorful and high yielding Southern Appalachian heirloom. Half Runner means a compact pole type bean with three to five foot runners. You'll still need to trellis them, but you'll get a similar yield as a true pole bean in less space. Pick these young as they get stringy when left on the plant too long. Mosaic resistant. Wow, I'm still thinking about how that neighbor came over to complain to (laughs) us for setting off fireworks. Yeah. And not even, she didn't even then try. She also came like unmasked, of course, to our door. Sure. She didn't even try like, we're in a duplex. So if she thought it was someone in this house. She didn't even try the other side of the duplex. She's eyeballed us. In she's the past decided we're like, the kind of people who would, we're the trash that would be setting off illegal street fireworks. Wow, I hope those kids set off more fireworks. Yeah, I hope they shoot some right into her car. Honestly, I mean, here's the thing: they're definitely going to shoot off more of those fireworks. Yeah, why tonight. wouldn't they? They there's no way they ran out, right? Yeah, no, they usually do it for like the whole week after New Year's. I mean, I wonder if she took her car to get it rewashed. Oh, and if that'd be so, so fucking I funny, really man. do hope. Oh, yeah. I should also mention, since this is a gardening podcast, that this house, they've installed a watering system for their lawn that is the sprinklers are placed so badly that they actually water the entire street. Yeah. And whenever I come home from work on the later side, m- my car gets sprayed yeah. with their sprinkler it's water so set- if someone wanted to complain about their car getting, getting fucked, up. fucked up they literally do that to my car 50 percent of the days of the week yeah and their sprinklers are going while it's raining all the time also just fyi but i i did overhear them talking about how they need to have a good lawn for the, for the flipping, flipping that process they're gonna do. yeah so. yeah these also are like they're people who are probably five years younger than us, too. So there's that extra resentment for how rich they are. All right, I'm going to read some gourds. Cool. Birdhouse bottle. This long-handled ball-shaped gourd can be hollowed out to make an attractive birdhouse, a big dipper gourd, or a musical instrument. Corsican bowl. Produces round, flattened green fruits that grow 6 to 12 inches in diameter and are 3 to 5 inches deep. Fruits have thin, tough skin that cures easily, making them great for making canteens or bowls. Yeah, all the gourd descriptions that I've ever seen in these catalogs, they really tell you what tools or items you can make out of them. Yeah, that's definitely what they're for. Yeah. Speckled swan. These whimsical gourds look just like a green bird with a long, curved neck and speckled feathers. Ornamental fruits reach 12 to 14 inches tall. Tennessee spinning top. Mm. Small two to three inch bottle shaped gourds with green striping. When dried, children love to spin the gourds like a top. What a great way to introduce your child to the garden. Plant a toy. <laughs> oh, I well, love that's that. cute. That's great. All children love gourds. <laughs> children love to play with gourds. Yeah. I mean, that is Famously. actually very fu- <laughs> a yeah. very funny claim. <laughs> I like, I mean, that's very cute. Though. But yeah, I agree. All right. Well, really enjoyable catalog, I think. Looks nice, reads nice, nice folks, nice ideology. May their worker owned cooperative remain strong and successful in this new year. Yes. Uh, before we go, I don't know how to transition into this, but I've made a cryptocurrency. <laughs> oh my God. <sighs> well, y- I mean, of course, we, as probably most people in our general demographic, treat with heavy irony the concept of cryptocurrencies and NFTs. But as a novelty, I've built a podcast cryptocurrency using, and I don't know what any of these words mean, the ERC-20 protocol 
on the Ethereum blockchain. I mean, I've, I don't understand what that I've means minted, either. You know, it involved me like doing a lot of Googling and copying and pasting a lot of like code and shit from the other people said would do a thing. Well, yeah, that's the kind of thing you want to tell people about your cryptocurrency. <laughs> Yeah, well, we're pumping it now, right? We're pumping our cryptocurrency. And people, people can't even. I don't think you can it. buy it, but I now have one million CD coin in a crypto wallet. So we'll find some way to use it in a it's stupidly. I think I don't see how it's possible that we could use it in any way. Well, if any listener wants some of this cryptocurrency, well, let hold me... on. Last night you said it would cost us fifty dollars to transfer any of it to anyone no, else. That's not necessarily true. So, one of the many insane things about cryptocurrency is that when you transfer it, there's like a what's called gas fee, which is like which is a term I'd encountered but never understood. Yeah, it's like some unknowable in advance amount that it costs to <laughs> like you can estimate what it will be but it, until it happens it's like not you can't know for sure but point being uh if you do it at the right time of the day it can be cheap it doesn't have to be fifty dollars but if you want some cryptocurrency let me know if you want to get in on the ground floor of cd coin and you have a crypto wallet let me know We'll see what we can do if you want, I don't know, 20,000 CD coin. Who the fuck cares? It's worth no uh, American dollars. I just, I don't even know how to process this. All right. If you're so inclined, you can elect to follow us on Twitter at, at CD Business or on Instagram at CD Business Pod, or you can email us at uh, CD Business Pod at gmail.com. Let us know if you'd like to talk about a particular catalog or if you leave us a review, we'll read it. And assuming that they can be funged, you should eat your vegetables. We're all just doing the best we can. Speak for yourself. It's CD Business. It's CD Business. Boring talk about seeds. CD talk between boars. Mind-numbing chatter. And split the difference CD business It's CD business